Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm Lynn Marquis. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for the Life Sciences. We work as the scientific advisors to the uh, Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus, which is now in our 18th season. Um, we've been presenting briefings that bring science taking place in labs across the country to those of you who fund the science uh, through the NIH. Uh, the, Mi the Biomedical Caucus is chaired by um, a bipartisan team uh, led by Rush Holt, Lois Capps, Mike Castle, and Brian Bilbray. We're very grateful for all the work and energy they put into our caucuses and um, have done a great job of, of forming a caucus season this year with um, some fantastic scientist. Um, in fact, today is, is a great uh, example of that. I am truly honored to be able to introduce to you Dr. Susan Lindquist, a world-renowned leader in molecular biology. Dr. Lindquist is a professor of biology at MIT, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, and a member and former director of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. Dr. Lindquist is best known for her research into the consequences of misfolded proteins. Protein misfolding has, and she'll explain this probably much better than I can, but protein misfolding has been implicated as a major mechanism in many severe neurological disorders, including Parkinson's. Nearly one million people in the U.S. struggle every day with Parkinson's, yet the cause of the disease is still not entirely clear. Lindquist and her colleagues have developed yeast strains that serve as living test tubes in which to study this and other disorders by unraveling how protein folding contributes to them. Um, I hope you will enjoy this briefing and learn something new and exciting, and um, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Lindquist. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I know that there will be a question and answer session at the end, but you, also if you, something occurs to you or if I haven't explained something right or left you hanging, feel free to interrupt right in the middle. I, I don't, not only do I not mind it, I would appreciate it. So I'm going to tell you today about some stuff we're doing with these organisms over here. And I don't know if they're, can we, can we get just these, maybe the front ones down? Um, so these, um, these cells here, these orange round guys, are uh, yeast cells. And uh, they're a very simple organism. They're a single-celled organism. They grow by budding. And uh, that's good. I think that, that that'll, that'll do it. Uh, and I'm going to be telling you about some stuff we're doing with these guys that we are hoping will help us to solve some very serious problems for these organisms over here, <laughs> mankind. And uh, the reason we can do that is that, oddly enough, one of the major, major lessons we've learned over the last 20 years or so of doing biological research is the following. Diversity masks unity. So as human beings, we are incredibly attuned to noticing differences in each other. We can recognize people's faces, thousands and thousands of different faces, instantaneously, even though the basic facial plan is really very similar. Uh, and so we're constantly, that's, there's a good evolutionary reason for that to have that ability to, to discriminate and be, be so attuned to diversity. I mean, it really helps you to know who your friends and your enemies are, who's likely to you know, give you a handout, who's likely to stab you in the back. It's, it's very important. But that tendency for, that natural human tendency to concentrate on diversity has wound up giving us a great big surprise as we started decoding the genomes of different organisms and as we started studying the biology of different organisms. There are some underlying unifying principles that are the same in, in every organism. And especially when you get up to a higher organism, like this yeast cell. Now you may think it's funny for me to call this a higher organism, because it looks pretty simple. But it turns out that it's quite a bit more complicated than a simple bacterial cell. Bacterial cells really do have a very simplified uh, living plan, lifestyle. Whereas these cells here have all kinds of the complicated features of divided compartments within the cells, things moving around within the cell, uh, DNA being replicated in the same way, cell cycle being re re replicated in the way, decisions of when a cell is going to divide or not going to divide. And so, in fact, many people have actually studied this yeast cell over here <coughs> to get some fundamental insights into cancer biology. It would sound kind of crazy, but you can work with this organism much more rapidly than you can with any other organism on the planet. And so what I'm going to be telling you is about, about some work we're doing to study neurodegenerative diseases in this organism. 
And uh, it all comes about because about 100 years or so ago, brewers decided that they wanted to make better beer. And so that's the organism that's responsible for creating beer and bread. Uh, and uh, they started streaking out the cells and started to study them, and they found out a lot about them. They found out how to manipulate them. And then they found out that they had some very simple properties that they could be used for genetic manipulations in ways that we just haven't been able to top with any other organism. So I'll, I'll be showing you uh, how we can take advantage of the, what, the, what is called the power of yeast genetics. So the basic problem I work on, as was mentioned, was protein folding. So what the heck is protein folding? So first of all, just about everything that you do is done by proteins. Because the skin is made of proteins, the muscles that move our arms around made of proteins, the, uh, the pigments in our eyes uh, that, are, that are actually allowing me to see you guys uh, are actually held in, 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 a, in a basket by a, by a protein. That protein communicates to other proteins down the nervous system in order to, for me to interpret that, that image. And so all of these very complicated things that, that you might think about you doing as you go about your life, it's all done by proteins. Proteins are not just food sources. The reason why we need protein as a food source is because we can't make all the component parts of proteins. And so we have to take some protein in as a food source, um, take it apart, and then use some of the building blocks to put together our own proteins, to create our own proteins. But really, basically, we are, uh, what we do is done by proteins. Now, the difficulty that cells have with regard to proteins is that the linear information that codes for proteins is encoded by DNA. And as you probably know, DNA is this long, it's called a double helix, this long linear string of information. Very, very long. And when it's first decoded into making a protein, that might be an enzyme that'll help me digest my meal, or as I, as I mentioned, um, the uh, pigment holding protein in my eye so I can see you. Those proteins are first decoded also as long linear strings. So the information of the DNA is long and linear, and the protein is first decoded as a long linear string. But it does nothing in that shape. It has to fold into these incredibly intricate shapes. Very, very, very specific shapes. You can see how complicated, and I'm only actually showing you the backbone of the protein to simplify its fold for you. This, it's, this is a protein that you probably know very well. It's called hemoglobin, and it carries oxygen around in your bloodstream. And unless it folds just like this, it can't bind the heme gro groups that are going to actually be able to carry the oxygen. So it has to fold just right. And this is a protein called green fluorescent protein. It's a protein from a jellyfish, and it glows green when you shine blue light on it. And uh, we borrow that protein all the time in cell biology to, um, to help us solve some problems. And I'll be showing you how we, how we use that. But you can see that they're folded in completely different ways, and they have to get it just right. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem is with that is that they have to do it in an absolutely ridiculous environment. <coughs> Inside of a living cell, the concentration of other proteins is incredible. So proteins are just constantly, constantly bumping into each other inside the cell. Now, why would, why would cells do something like this? They do it because it, it gives them a lot of efficiency. Once they have the proteins folded into these proper shapes, you can pass a molecule of oxygen from one to the other, or you can pass an electron from one to the other. You can pass an enzyme, can be digesting glucose and break it apart and pass it to the next, next enzyme down the string that's gonna, gonna break it down even further and create energy out of it. But getting the proteins folded in the first place is very, very hard. So when you think about proteins going about their business in, in living cells, it's not like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. So I don't know if you can hear this, but we couldn't get the microphone system working. It's, it's more like the characters in a Marx Brothers movie, <laughs> where chaos is poised on the precipice of disaster. <laughs> Now, so this is what protein folding people call going off pathway. <laughs> and it happens in, in living cells all the time. Proteins are in this chaotic, chaotic environment. And sometimes they don't get folded properly. Or sometimes even when they are folded properly, they get banged into by a bunch of other proteins that are in there. 
and they, they wind up unfolding, and that causes a lot of problems. So as you might imagine, this is a really pretty fundamental, basic property of life, having all these proteins so crowded together and so efficiently packed together. So this problem and the solutions to this problem are common amongst all organisms, and they're shared by all organisms. So yeast cells solve that problem in the same way that we do. So our motto in terms of thinking about some of the complex problems of biology, not all, of course, will be able to be approached in yeast, but when you can approach a complex problem, find a simple place to start and move around from there. And the simplest, most elegant place to start is in these yeast cells. So we use them as sort of living test tubes because it's almost, if you want to try to study, well, why is this protein not folding right? You have to recreate it within this very intense, crowded environment if you're going to really learn anything much about it. So we basically take the genetic coding regions that code for various proteins that misfold and cause human diseases, and we take that genetic code and we do what we call transform a yeast cell with that genetic code. So now the yeast cell is making one of our proteins a protein that's prone to misfolding and causing disease. And uh, that allows us to study some pretty complicated problems in neurobiology. And as I mentioned, others have used this, and we have too, to study some pretty fundamental aspects of cancer biology as well. So here are a few neurodegenerative diseases. These are simple um, slides that a pathologist would, would prepare after uh, doing, uh, doing an autopsy on someone who's died of one of these diseases. Alzheimer's, frontal temporal dementias, uh, Parkinson's, Creutzfeldt-Jakob or, or mad cow disease, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, and, and Huntington's disease. And what they have in common, as you see in these slides, is big brown blobs. What those are are misfolded proteins that have accumulated in these neurons. <coughs> and it's thought that these proteins that misfold are really in a large part responsible for some of the neurons dying and the, and the terrible problems of neurodegenerative diseases. And in fact, although that was just kind of a supposition about 10 years ago, it's now pretty, pretty clear that that is, in fact, the case. So I'm going to tell you about the work we're doing with Parkinson's <coughs> disease. Uh, we are actually trying to create several other models as well. We have one with Huntington's. We think we might have one for ALS. We think we might have one for Alzheimer's. But we're, it's still early days there, and I'm not sure yet whether we're going to be able to find anything with those models that will be relevant to the neurobiology in, in a human being who's suffering from these diseases. But I am quite certain now that we have achieved that with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is, is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder and it's deadly. Uh, it's progressive, and um, people often don't die of the disease per se, but of complications that arise in association with the disease. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible disorder. And it's characterized by the loss of a particular type of neuron in the nervous system. So um, it's beginning to be believed that maybe many different neurons are affected, but there's one particular type of neuron. It's called the dopaminergic neuron. And you might have heard the Parkinson's patients being treated with L-DOPA. Um, it's, a, it's a drug to replace the fact that this one particular type of neuron is, is dying. And so it has always been thought that the only place you could really study this disease would be in a neuron, and in fact, in those particular types of neurons. But we thought, well, maybe if it's got to do with the problem in protein folding, maybe we could at least get understand some aspects of the disease by studying it, the protein in yeast. Now, the aggregated protein... A Nussbaum's group demonstrated a few years ago that the aggregated protein that's found in those neurons that are dying in people who have this disease is a particular protein called alpha-synuclein. We don't know much about how it functions. We do know that it seems to be located at the ends of the, of, of the cell, where one nerve cell contacts another nerve cell. And there are clearly... a quite bewildering variety of environmental influences, things like mitochondrial poisons. <coughs> People being exposed to mitochondrial poisons can cause them to have something that looks just like Parkinson's disease. There are also some genetic forms of the disease. It's mostly sporadic. That is, what we mean by sporadic is we just don't know what is causing it. Probably a combination of some genetic and environmental influences working together in many cases. Maybe in many cases some genes of small effect. But in some cases, there is clearly one gene 
that is wrong, and you can see it segregating in families. You can see parents passing it on to their, their children. One gene that, that's not working properly, and that will lead to this very specific disease. And interestingly, one of the genes that can cause Parkinson's disease when it's mutated is the gene that encodes this protein. So when I say gene, I just mean the unit of DNA that codes for a particular protein. And stop me if I, if I use any terminology you're not familiar with. I'm, again, I'm happy to, happy to stop. So we try to study this in yeast. What we did was to take advantage of the fact that yeast cells love sugars. It's what mankind has been taking advantage of them for for a long time as making beer and bread. But they love sugars and they discriminate between different sugars very, very carefully. And so we can actually turn on and off the synthesis of a particular protein by putting a regulatory unit, it's called a promoter, that responds to a sugar. So we can transform these yeast cells with the gene encoding that alpha-synuclein protein that's clumping together in the brains of Parkinson's victims. And uh, we, can, we can turn it on whenever we want with something called galactose. And what we do in these studies, as I mentioned, we stitch up the genetic code for that protein to the genetic code for green fluorescent protein from this jellyfish. Because that will allow us to see where the protein is. <coughs> and we can follow it moving around the cell. Just looking under the microscope, we can actually see it. So when we put in one copy of that gene, uh, something very nice happened. The protein went to the ends of the membrane of the cell sort of in the same location that it's located in, in neurons associated with membranes. Although one thing that yeast cells does not have that neurons have is neurons will take little, they have little vesicles of membrane-bounded compartments that move around all over the cell, do all kinds of interesting things. And neurons will dock those at the end of a neuron and only release them, for example, release dopamine when you need the dopamine. Yeast cells don't do that, they're just constantly releasing those things. and so. We expected it to end up on the plasma membrane, the outer boundary of the cell, and that's exactly where it went. So the idea was, okay, this protein misfolding is happening all the time, protein mistraffic is happening all the time, and the, the cells are keeping up with it, they've got all kinds of defense mechanisms for it. But perhaps as we're aging, because our neurons are with us forever, from the time we were born, we're using the same neurons we had when we, we were born, um, maybe after a long time, the protein, what we call quality control systems of the cell, start to deteriorate and break down. And maybe we could, we could mimic that by just putting a little extra burden on the cell's protein quality control systems by asking the cells to make a little bit more of this protein. So we simply doubled the dose. And now, as you can see, tremendous change in what was happening to this protein we get big clumps. Is this in any way related to the toxicity that occurs in neurons? Well, we can just do a simple growth curve. And what we saw, this is simply uh, watching the density of the culture. And when, when you have just a few cells in the culture, it's clear, but it gets cloudier and cloudier and cloudier as they, as they grow up. And these guys have the one dose of the protein. These cells have two doses of the protein. We turn it on, they double once, and that's it, they die. Okay? So there's an extreme dosage sensitivity here. You can make one dose of this protein, and the cells are just perfectly fine. They make twice as much as they normally would, and they die. That's very unusual. There are not many proteins that have that extreme dosage sensitivity. Very few. But interestingly, it's true for the alpha-synuclein protein of humans. So this was a study that came out when we were just publishing our first study. Um, and it says alpha-synuclein locus triplication causes Parkinson's disease. So we each have two chromosomes. We have one from our mother, one from our father. So we should each have two copies of alpha-synuclein gene. But in some people, that gene gets amplified so that they have now three copies on one chromosome, one on the other. So they're making twice as much alpha-synuclein as they should. And they will get early onset Parkinson's disease. So that extreme dosage sensitivity, that, that was kind of interesting to us. It suggested, well, maybe we are mimicking some of the same kinds of protein folding and trafficking problems that are occurring in neurons. So we looked at a few other things. I'm just going to show you a couple of them. 
But neurodegenerative diseases are associated with something called uh, oxidative damage or reactive oxygen species. These are things that are released from the energy compartments in our cell that fuel, fuel the activities of our cell. And they get released by accident, really, and they damage proteins and damage everything nearby. But it's, it's characteristic of many neurodegenerative diseases. And in these yeast cells, we can very easily assay whether they're getting reactive oxygen species damage by putting a little dye in the culture. That dye doesn't do anything much unless there's, it gets hit by a reactive oxygen species. When it gets hit by a reactive oxygen species, it glows green. The different kind of glowing green than the, the one I showed you with, with the alpha synuclein, but it's, it's, it happen, just happens to be the same color. So these are our cells that are making one dose. This is the normal light microscope image of the cell. And this is, there's no green here. You can see that these guys that are making two doses are blazing with reactive oxygen species. So something is going wrong, and they're releasing oxygen all over the place. So that and some other things I won't take the time to tell you about gave us the feeling that it was worthwhile doing what we call a high-throughput genetic screen. Um, this is something that's easier to do in yeast cells than, than in any other organism. So what uh, Josh LeBear's group did at the Harvard Proteomics Center was to take every single gene coding for every single protein in the entire yeast genome and put that gene behind, we were very happy to find out, the exact same regulatory sequence that we had used. So now we can take what's called a library of these genes. We have in our freezer stacks of plates that contain, each one contains a different one of these genes. We transform them into our yeast cells. And then at the moment we want to test how does that gene affect the cell's ability to cope with this misfolding, mistrafficking alpha synuclein? We turn them both on together. It's a very clean experiment, very hard to do in other organisms. So we did that. We tested every single gene in the, in the yeast genome for, to find out what, what is the genetic architecture of, of what, what would help the cells, what would make them feel better, but make them feel worse. And it's very simple. We now actually have some robots that are going to speed up our ability to do this. This, this took us quite a while to do, actually, because we were doing it stamping by the, the, the cells on agar plates by hand. But we, we've now recently gotten some robots that I think will help us do this much, much more rapidly. So we got some genes that made the cells feel better, some genes that made the cells feel worse. And uh, of course, the important, crucial experiment, after all this work, where our, kind of our, our uh, hearts were in our stomach, uh, you know, really wondering whether this was going to work, uh, we decided to test these in neuronal models. There's no other way to find out whether we were on the right track or not. So we tested these in three different models. We tested them in something called the nematode worm. It's a, it's a very simple little creature, but it's more complicated than a yeast cell. And it has not only neurons, but it has different types of neurons. In fact, it has the same kind of neuron that releases dopamine, the same kind of neurotransmitter that is defective in the patients with Parkinson's disease. And what's really nice about this worm is it's clear. You can see right through it. So you can label those neurons with a colored protein, and you can actually see whether the neurons are living or dying. We also did this in a fruit fly. This is a little harder to do because the only way you can score the fruit fly, which is also uh, producing a little bit too much of this alpha synuclein protein and showing defects, the only way you can, you can assay this fruit fly is you, you have to sacrifice the fly and actually slice its brain open and see whether or not the, the neuronal, that neuronal cell type is dying. This we did in collaboration with Guy Caldwell's group. This we did in collaboration with Nancy Bonini's group. And the third system we've used was to use rat neurons. Um, we are now doing some experiments with whole animals, uh, mice in fact, but those experiments take a very, very long time. So uh, these experiments take a fraction of that amount of time. And what we were able to do, what, what Chris does, is he takes, dissects out, this is a very laborious assay, he takes, dissects out the midbrain region of embryos from a pregnant rat puts them in culture for a while, and then he has them express, he puts a virus on them that'll cause them to express this protein that misfolds in the brain. And it kills neurons, and it kills the dopamine-transmitting neurons even more than it kills the average neuron. 
And so we could then ask, would our genes that we had gotten in our screen rescue the neurons from the worm, the neurons from the fly, and the neurons in this rat culture dish? And we like using the different models because here, the, the, these neurons are a lot closer to our neurons, of course. But here, the neurons are wired up into their normal context in the whole brain. So having the combination of both of these assays is really helpful. So here's what the data looks like. He just counted the number of dopaminergic neurons versus other neurons in the culture. When they're not overexpressing alpha-synuclein, you get about 7%. When they overexpress alpha-synuclein, that number drops. If we express an unrelated gene, no effect. But if we take the home log, the, gene, the, the matching gene from the, from the rat genome that matches the genes we got out of yeast, and express that gene, it rescues. It doesn't rescue completely, but it rescues. And that's fine because it actually doesn't rescue completely in yeast cells either, but it rescues pretty well. We think actually we're going to need a combination of different things in order to rescue fully. So that was done in collaboration with Chris Rocher's lab at Purdue. And we have now completed the analysis of eight other genes from our screen, some suppressors, some things that made the cells better, suppress the toxicity, and some enhancers, some things that made the, uh, made the toxicity worse, enhanced the toxicity. And uh, seven out of the eight work in the neurons. So that's actually pretty remarkable. That then, yes? Does that mean then that you're looking at these genes as being either genetic vulnerability for Parkinson's disease and then some of the genes are perhaps potential genetic treatment yes. therapy? Yes, exactly. Yes, you can imagine that if, if you've got a protein which whose activity makes things worse, if you could find a drug that would inhibit that protein, it, it might be better. Or if you, could, uh, if you have a gene uh, that makes the cells better, if you could find a drug that would activate that protein, it might, it might be a, a therapeutic strategy. So both the suppressors and the enhancers are, are therapeutic strategies. In one case, you'd want to find a drug that would inhibit it. In the other case, you'd want to find a drug that would activate it. No. There's, there's no therapy that is based upon the underlying biological problem in the disease. It, it, their therapies are based upon the consequences, the fact that dopaminergic neurons are dying, but not on what is what the underlying cause of why those nerves are, nerve cells are dying. Yes? Uh, it's about 50%. Um, uh, on average, uh, about, about half of the genes in yeast have a direct homolog in humans. And moreover, many of, them are so sim many of them are so similar, especially the most fundamental proteins. Many of them are so similar that you can knock that, you can do a genetic excision of that gene in yeast. You can do pinpoint genetics, where you can just go in there and you're going to kill that gene. Many of the genes that are essential in yeast, that you can't, that you kill the cell if you do that, you can substitute the human, pro human gene for it. So there, there's a very, very high level of homology. Those were all conserved. So in, in, interestingly, in terms of, we think we're hitting some really basic fundamental biological problems here. And um, in terms of, of the genes that we got out of the yeast screen, a majority of them actually had human homologs, more than you might expect by random chance. Now, I should also explain that we think that some of the other genes in yeast that we don't know quite what they do yet will actually turn out to have direct human counterparts. It's just that they've, their sequences have drifted apart to the point where we can't, can't see that homology anymore. And then there are, of course, going to be other things that are just specific for a yeast cell or just specific for a human cell. But many of the things that human beings do, they do by taking the machinery of basic, these basic types of cells, and then they, they duplicate those genes, and they diverge a little bit, and they do slightly different things, but they're very highly related. And then they keep one, one gene that does the same thing. So this gave us the courage to um, then try a drug screen. So uh, we went uh, to collaborate with some folks at, at Harvard to do this, and we're now running some, some other drug screens at the Broad Institute, which is uh, even a little bit more convenient because it's right next door to, to MIT, right where, in the Whitehead where I am. But um, we screened through 100,000, over 100,000 compounds. 
Now, the reason we can do that is because it's really cheap and easy to grow yeast cells. You can grow them in these little, I should have brought a plate actually for you. They have these tiny little, they have platelet about this big that will have 384 little, little wells in it. And you can put a little bit of yeast cells in every single one of these wells, use that sugar to turn on the expression of that protein, and the cells will die. So what do we do? We just screen for compounds that would rescue the yeast cells. And that actually accomplished several goals in one. I told you that the genetics of this disease was, was, it seems to be very complex. There are several different genes that can be mutated and, and cause this disorder. Um, and we think that there are many other genes that might be mildly mutated and might cause, in combination, lead to the disorder. And I mentioned that there were some environmental components, so it's a, it's a very complicated gene, uh, disease. And in keeping with that, we found a lot of genes in yeast that affect it. So we wouldn't know which one to pick, which is going to be the best target to go, go after. So instead of our deciding which one to pick, we're letting the yeast cells tell us what makes them feel better. Right? So rather than, rather than isolating a particular protein and looking for a drug that would activate or inhibit that protein, what we're doing is asking, doing the assay in the living yeast cell and asking for them to recover. The other advantage of that is that often when people do drug screens, they get compounds that work wonderfully to activate a particular protein or inhibit a particular protein, but they can't get them into a cell. And then they might have to spend even a couple of two or three years to get them inside the cell. So we're only going to pick up things that will get inside the cell. And the third thing is that by asking the cells to come back to life, we're not going to get compounds that are intrinsically toxic. Now, the fact that it helps the yeast cell doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help a neuron, of course. But we're not going to, we're going to eliminate all the things that are just generally and broadly intrinsically toxic. And uh, most of the things that will kill a neuron will also kill a yeast cell. So we got, this was an extremely rigorous screen. We got only a small number of hits out of 150,000 compounds. We got a small number of hits. You can imagine how difficult it would be, however, to screen 150,000 compounds in, in even a fruit fly model. <laughs> <laughs> just can you imagine the fly stocks and the fly room and everything. Very, very, very difficult. So we only got seven. But very, very rigorous screen. How many people helped you on this disease? With robot, well, two, two people from my laboratory did this, and I'll be showing their faces in a minute. Um, and in collaboration with the Harvard uh, Chemical Genomic Screening Facility, where they have robots that do a lot of this stuff for you. So it's it's really nice to be able to have a cell suspension that grows in liquid culture where you can just drop in with a robot. You just drop in a little, a little, drop, of, a little drop of cells in every one of these wells and they do that automatically for you. It's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I forgot to modify this slide for the more general audience here, but there was a very specific type of defect that we noticed in our cells in terms of things that traffic around, the, the ways in which proteins move around the cells. And when we went and looked at those, those cells and looked at whether or not we were fixing that problem with the protein <coughs> moving around in the right places in the cell, we did. So we didn't screen on that basis, but we got something that fixed that problem. So we think that problem is actually quite integral to the to toxicity of the cell for synuclein. And very exciting for us, the compounds that work in yeast cells work in both the nematode. We haven't tested them in the fruit fly. Fruit flies are actually harder to do drug screens on. But they work in the nematode, and they also work in rat neurons and culture. And something else that we're very excited about is I mentioned to you that there are certain kinds of toxins and poisons in the environment that can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. One of those are compounds that target a particular organelle in the cell called the mitochondria, and rotenone is one of those compounds. And so these are cells, both have been treated with rotenone, but these have been treated, these have not been treated with our rescuing compound. These guys have been treated with our rescuing compound. I think you can see that these guys look a lot healthier than these guys over here. In particular, this is a dopaminergic neuron. We are able to recognize different types of neurons in the, color, in the culture by actually reacting them with protein antibodies that have different colors on them. And so that's the kind of neuron that, that uh, breaks down in the nervous system with people who have Parkinson's disease. And you might see a very faint one here. This one is shrunken and it doesn't have its nice long processes where neurons communicate with other, other neurons. This one now has those processes rescued. So this is telling us that alpha-synuclein is uh, causing a type of pathology in a yeast cell that when we rescue it, 
we can not only re we can take that compound and those genes, and we can not only rescue neurons from alpha synuclein, the protein that you see in that big glob in the neurons. We can also use it to rescue against mitochondrial toxins. So this really ties, it's telling us some interesting biology that those mitochondrial toxins are probably working through the misfolding and misfunctioning, mistrafficking of alpha synuclein. So why dopaminergic neurons? I've, so what we think is happening is that this is a very general problem in cell biology and it would eventually affect any cell in your body. But neurons are just more vulnerable to it because it's a problem involving protein trafficking, moving proteins around the cell and getting, them at the, getting, them, getting those vesicles to the end of, ends of the, the synapse where nerves talk to each other to deliver that dopamine. And so the, the dopaminergic neurons are just much more sensitive. When problems in trafficking go wrong, they're just much more sensitive to it, so they die first, and, and that's it. So it looks like a very, very specific biology. It's just that the, a, the other aspects of, of the biology of those cells make them more vulnerable to a very general insult. That's, that's been our basic conclusion. So I'm hoping this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, as I mentioned, we have some other neuronal disease models. I, I'm sure some of them are not going to work. <laughs> I can guarantee it. But we think that some of the others might. And even if they only tell us a, a small part of the picture, to be able to get that small part of the picture more rapidly by using these fast-growing cells that you can manipulate so well, even if it's only a small part of the picture, it still will be helpful to, to I think, apply these, these um, yeast cells to our, to our terrible problems. And before I close, I want to mention the people who've done this work because I think one of the really fabulous things about biology and doing biological research is the young people and with their <coughs> tremendous enthusiasm and all the heart that they put in, heart and soul they put into their experiments. And um, this is Tiago Otero who started the Alpha Synuclein Project and Anil uh, started the uh, high throughput genetic screening. Aaron Gittler finished that. Uh, Tiago also did the drug screen. Uh, Julie Sue has been trying to identify exactly what the target of that drug is. Kent Matlock is working on a, the Huntington Project. Um, Simon is working on protein degradation. Uh, and these are our wonderful collaborators. So in addition to having these wonderful people in my laboratory who are really working their hearts and souls out, literally, they, they really work so hard, um, we have these wonderful, wonderful collaborators all over the country who have also been, been helping us. And it's, it's a tremendous way to speed up the way in which research goes by going to an expert, calling him up on the phone and saying, hey, I've got something really excited. Would you like to collaborate? And I, I, I'm collaborating with more people than I ever have in my life. So Paul Muchowski, we did the screen, an earlier screen with Anthony Cooper. We did the trafficking work, moving proteins around the cell. Chris Roche, Nancy, and, and Guy, I mentioned to you already. And which universities are they? Uh, OK. So uh, Paul was in Seattle, although he's now moved to San Francisco. Anthony was in Kansas. He's now moved to Australia. <laughs> it's a long, long distance collaboration. Purdue University, uh, University of Alabama, and Penn. And I mentioned the Harvard Institute of Proteomics that had done the cloning of those genes, uh, Bupinder Bular uh, and Josh LeBaire. And then Carolyn Shamu was the person who was running the chemical and cell biological laboratory. We did the drug screen and helped us tremendously in getting that set up. And then finally, I want to thank the National Institutes of Health for support on this. Um, it was not easy to get support, I have to tell you on this. A lot of people thought we were crazy to study neurodegenerative disease in yeast, but we eventually did get support from NIH. We also got support from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, the Hereditary Disease Foundation, the Ellison Foundation, and the McMahon <coughs> Foundation. So thank you all for listening, and I'm happy, happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes. Yeah. Looking at all of this, I'm actually a cardiovascular and neurophysiologist and, mm -hmm. and many years ago mm -hmm. studied and uh, taught at Michigan. But this is really phenomenal because um, I did work on neurons that um, looked at receptors in the cardiovascular system and then lived in Italy and worked with mm -hmm. the Italians. The Japanese were very opportunistic after the Second World War, but it wasn't as popular. Yes. And so I'm really, this is very, very interesting because not only on this level, but I'm, I'm sure that your work, because it's very, very, very fundamental, yeah. is going to be well received. And um, you should probably tell us what you would anticipate uh, so that we know 
what to tell people in terms of future funding or how you envision? I, I think okay. I think it's extremely important to fund basic science because it's a fulcrum point. It's like a lever. I mean, uh, our, our committee say, give me a, a, a lever and a, and a place to stand, and I will move the earth. <laughs> And uh, that was a couple thousand years ago, but he's right today. And I think basic science research is really that, that lever in the fulcrum point. It really is. And, and um, I think that what, one of the very exciting things that's happening right now is that basic biology and clinical biology are, are, are bumping into each other all the time now. So my work 20 years ago, I never would have dreamt, I really would not have dreamt I'd ever be working on a disease. Because I just thought it was the tools were kind of slow and frustrating, and I didn't think I'd be able to make as much of a contribution. Now half of my lab is working on diseases, and uh, we're doing so because because of um, a couple of things. Uh, one is that we have now understand so much basic biology that we can see the connections <laughs> to basic biology and human diseases in so much greater detail than we ever thought we could. And that doesn't mean that it's time to stop doing the basic stuff now. The more basic stuff, it just keeps on fueling us to understand even more the, the clinical biology. But also, the problems of human biology and disease are fascinating. They're intellectually fascinating. Once you know enough about them, you start to untangle them. It's just amazing biology. So a lot of basic biologists are starting to get very, very interested in clinical diseases now because for, for not only for a motive of which, which I have very strong, I think most of them do, just that, God, it would be awfully fulfilling at the end of your lifetime to look back and say, I made a difference. You know, I'd really love to have that feeling if I could have it. But I also have to say that I like going to work every day because it's so exciting and interesting. <laughs> and so these, these intellectual puzzles of these uh, trying to unravel some of these, these clinical diseases are very important. So this translational aspect of research is, is, um, is really coming to the fore right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, <coughs> I should say first that I have Parkinson's disease. I've had it for 12 years. Mm -hmm. and, and I've also participated in a lot of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And at NIH and in drug companies. And, and I find that there's a difference between <coughs> curing a rat or a fruit. Oh, absolutely. And curing a person. Absolutely. Who had actually done the death <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So the interaction between the, the human, the human, the human element, and the biology in the mm -hmm. yes application right of a this which looks very powerful. Yes, there. Thank, thank, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I don't mean to say that we're around the corner with the cure now. Um, but I think one of the problems that we've had in terms of the treatments for Parkinson's disease is that they haven't been based upon understanding the basic underlying biology, the problems in the biology. And I, I didn't mention it to you, but we really do think we're beginning to uncover that. We actually, um, one of the genes that we uncovered in our yeast screen is actually a gene which when mutated causes early onset Parkinson's disease. It's called PARC9. It's one of the newest genes that's been discovered. And we find that when we overexpress that gene in yeast, it cures the yeast cells of the alpha-synuclein. So there had never been even a connection between PARC9 and alpha-synuclein before. They seem to be completely unrelated proteins. But we've shown that, that the yeast homologue of that human gene will rescue our yeast cells. So I really do think we're getting at biology that's relevant to humans. Does that mean the compounds we've gotten out of, of this screen are going to mean anything? I, it's going to take a while. It's definitely going to take a while. But I do believe that really we're unco by, by uncovering the underlying fundamental biological problems that are going wrong is going to be a, an important step forward rather than just trying to do symptomological treatment. One more. Mm -hmm. can, can, can you leapfrog some of, some of the knowledge and just try to apply some of the Multifactorial. Yeah, it's, it's to do things in combination. Is that what you mean, or? Well, um, for people who have Parkinson's disease now, uh, time is, you know, the FDA process 
takes a long time. I know, I know. And, and uh, so we're eager to <laughs> try to. Yeah. So uh, this is what, what I'm doing. Um, I developed these yeast assays several, a few years ago, and I had a very hard time getting it funded. I took the yeast assays to uh, various pharmaceutical companies and said, you know, why don't you try screening this? You know, it's so cheap and easy, and it, it's, it's worth a try. And they didn't want to have any part of it. They thought it was idiotic to look at a yeast cell for Parkinson's disease. The basic, the reason why we do it is I've been working on protein folding all my life, and I know that those diseases are involved with problems in protein homeostasis, protein folding, and trafficking. So I, and that's really, that underlying biology is quite similar in yeast cells. So I then finally decided I was going to form a company to do, to do it. And it's been invested in by several different venture capital groups. I now own a mere pittance of the company. <laughs> I'm not going to make any money on this at all. But what I might do is I might be able to see something that we've discovered in our laboratory actually be translated in, into, the, into the real world. So what they have done is they have the money and the facilities to screen many, many, many more compounds. And they have compounds that they're now testing in rats. And you're right, um, whether they're going to work in rats does not mean that they're going to work in humans because there have been some very disappointing things in the past. But again, I think a lot of the really disappointing stuff in the past has been not based upon the underlying fundamental biological defect. So I've, all I can say is I've got my fingers crossed. So do all of my students and postdocs. We're working really hard, and we really care about it. Okay. Yes? <coughs> L-DOPA is the mainstay of course treatment now, and, we, and it's not based on fundamental biology, but just helps the symptoms. So does any of this, uh, and, and after a while, I'll let it stop working. So does any of this help maybe get a better L-DOPA kind of approach? Well, I think, it, I'm, I think that what this will do is actually uh, be something that could, um, that could either extend, L, it's, it's a different approach, right? And it could lead to something that would either extend the benefits of L-DOPA therapy much longer or prevent the progression um, uh, if you can identify people earlier on. And, but it's, it's going to be, as, as he says, it's very frustrating. The, the getting things approved through the FDA is a slow process. On the other hand, um, it is, you don't want to be treating people with, with drugs that could make them worse. And, you know, we have found that with this particular, with this particular protein folding and protein homeostasis problem, you know, just a two-fold difference in one component is all the difference between everything being fine and, ev and the cells dying. So there, it could wind up being that there could be that kind of, that kind of aspect to some of, the, some of the therapeutic treatments as well. So, we really, we have to take this uh, carefully and slowly because the last thing we want to do is make make someone worse. But um, I, I do think I'm, I'm all I can say is I'm hopeful. This is a different type of approach. Even if nothing we get out of a yeast cell ever works, at least we've discovered some of the genes and the pathways that connect up that previously had not been connected up before. Those are connecting up in neuron neuronal cells too. So even if Nothing we get out of yeast other than understanding the biology works and what you really have to do is screen for drugs and neurons. We're going to get there. We're trying to do that too. We're trying to make stem cells right now that will express this protein and that we can differentiate into neurons. And we're trying to get human cells and we're, you know, we're, 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 gonna, we're <laughs> trying every avenue we can really is what I would say. Yes, we did. And we didn't see anything that worked. But um, one thing that we haven't tried is to try screening them all combinatorially um, in mixtures and to see whether a combination of two or three things um, might work. That we have not done, and that's well worth trying. So I, I, in fact, I was just thinking about that last night. <laughs> I'm going to go back and see if I can't get that started in the lab. Can I ask a, funny question, a question about funding? Excuse me. Um, you're doing basic cell biology alongside some translational work. And then you're also doing collaborations, which I think is fascinating. But can you talk a little bit about the NIH funding being flat for five years and all of that? Can you talk a little bit about, are you finding it easier to get basic biology funded? Or no. Science funded? It's not easy to get basic biology funded, which is one of the reasons I mentioned in response to your question. Um, I, I think that the flat funding for science in this country has been a, a tragedy of unbelievable proportions. 
It's a small amount of money on our federal budget, and the United States was at the absolute forefront of molecular sciences, absolute forefront, and we're losing that lead. It's tragic. And it's, How many it's, years do you think you'd be lost in your research from discovering to get funding? Oh, I, I, I accumulated over my lifetime, years. <laughs> Uh, I have had a lot of grants turned down, and it's very, very, very frustrating. The, the, the difference is this, and I, and I can't blame the NIH itself in terms of the way they're giving out their money, because if, if you've only got a limited amount of money to give out, you're going to give it out to something that looks like it's going to be a sure thing, <coughs> right? It's very hard to give out that money to something that has maybe a 25% chance of succeeding. On the other hand, things that sometimes have only a 25% chance of succeeding might make the big leap. It's called high risk, high payoff research. And we really need to be at least putting some funds into high risk, high payoff research. Because in the long run, that's what really, that's what really moves things and shakes things. And did you find hurdles with doing, through with funding issues um, in engaging folks in collaborations across the country? Yeah, our, our collaborators are also in the same boat that we are in, in terms of having to scrape around all over the place for, for funding. and to be using graduate students who are only working part-time instead of you know, postdocs and highly trained technicians. Um, I mean, you always want to have the new people being trained in your lab, but it's a, it's a shame to have to depend upon the progress of your experiments by new people who are just being trained. So um, it's, it's, it's been, been frustrating. Um, I think that lately we've been getting a lot more recognition for this. We've been getting quite a bit of, it's been getting quite a bit of coverage, and I'm hoping it'll get easier now. But I'm hoping not just for me that it'll get easier now. I hope that people will start, people who thought we were crazy will start to realize that you know, well, yeah. doing some of this crazy stuff is a really important thing to do because it, it really does fundamentally change the way in which you can approach some problems. So, um, and then I will also have to say in terms of funding that uh, um, one thing that, one, the one bright shining light has been American philanthropy. There are some philanthropists out there who give generously of their fortunes uh, for doing high risk. And, and they often are people who've made money by being entrepreneurial themselves, by trying something. And so they really have an entrepreneurial spirit, and they like to give money to high risk, high payoff research. Um, uh, and, and I think some of the great philanthropists who, who, have, who have left money to research or are giving money currently to research are, are making a huge difference in the network and fabric of American science, but it's not enough. We, our government should be doing, doing more. I didn't really come here to do a step on a soapbox, but, but I will as long as you ask me. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Thank you for listening. Thank you.